Welcome, everyone. We are going to have a very interesting episode about school-based physical activi- activity, and we have a brilliant guest. Our guest is working as a reader in physical activity and healthy childhood in University of Bradford, UK. His research focuses on the design, development, and evaluation of behavior change interventions for physical activity and health in children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Dr. Andrew Daly-Smith. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, pleasure to be on the podcast. Yeah, nice to nice to have you. So, should we start? Could you could you give a short introduction of of yourself? Of course. Well, I, I think probably a little bit of history first. So, I, my uh, my initial sort of um, work in higher education was uh, at Leeds Beckett University. Um, I actually entered higher education as a lecturer with a practitioner background and didn't actually really have a a strong research CV. So. I think gone of the days of employing those types of lecturers, and I, I cl- class myself as very fortunate. Um, in my time at Leeds Beckett, and I was there for 18 years in the end, um, uh, before moving to Bradford 18 months ago. And during that time, I, I had the uh, real privilege to be mentored by Professor Jim McKenna, who's one of the leading lights in physical activity um, and, and has an exceptional mind. And and under his tutelage, um, eventually decided to do a PhD, which I thought I would never do. Um, And I think the thing that Jim taught me was always to look beyond the immediate. And what I mean by that was quite often as researchers, we get trapped within our discipline areas. And it tends to create quite narrow thinking in terms of looking for solutions to problems. So Jim had me reading books around organisational change and behaviour change, um, which, which were very different to the physical activity journals that I was uh, used to reading. So sort of fast forward through that that 18 years, I, I got my PhD in 2019, so very late in my career. And again, I, I, I feel very fortunate that I was supported to do that within my role at Leeds Beckett because it allowed me to do a PhD that I was truly passionate about and I could self-direct what I wanted to focus on. And also I had a wealth of experience to bring to the PhD um, from a practice field, but also from uh, applied research, having worked on a number of different research projects. And I think that really helped me to focus into what mattered. So I started my PhD... um, by looking at the effects of physical activity on cognition. Um, I actually started in, in looking at obese children on a residential weight loss camp, and then halfway through having collected nearly all of my data, uh, switched to school-based physical activity because I real, realized that's where my passion was and had been doing some uh, commercial research on the side that, that turned into my PhD. And while doing my PhD, I kind of realized that there's, there was a real... Um, investment within research and practice in kind of singular interventions within schools. So no matter how much we worked looking at the basic science of the links between physical activity and cognition, actually until we could improve the quality of the physical activity within the schools, so to make it more impactful and sustainable, actually there was little point starting to look at the um, cognitive or academic outcomes because if there's an issue with an implementation of the actual intervention, we, we're not really giving the pill that we think we're giving on a regular dose um, and as a sustainable dose. So actually very quickly since my PhD has shifted into um, kind of whole systems change within school-based physical activity. And that's what led me to Bradford. And and again, I I class myself as extremely fortunate. Um, It was a conversation in a hot tub at a conference uh, (laughs) with a researcher who was talking to me um, about his line manager leaving. And there was a fantastic programme in the UK where our national funding agency called Sport England funded, funded 12 what are called local delivery pilots where they were putting large investment into 12 areas and empowering those areas to take systems approaches to physical activity. And one was happening in Bradford, which was focused on children and young people. 
So I'd already started to be involved through the school's work, but with the research lead going on maternity leave, I moved across to manage the research team for a period of nine months. And during that time, I was then asked to apply for the readership at the University of Bradford. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. So I, I moved uh, during the middle of the pandemic, which was a really interesting experience. Um, I still, even 18 months in, feel as I've not fully got my feet under the table. Um, but it's been a, a really sort of fantastic place to work because the university's twinned in with uh, Bradford Institute for Health Research and have got a fantastic programme of research and a cohort study um, called Born in Bradford. And that cohort study helps to drive the implementation of interventions that follow um, the, uh, when they identify the issues within the, that need solving within the population. And, and since arriving there, my, my role's kind of expanded, really. So I, I'm the what's called the Wilson Centre uh, theme lead for Healthy Childhood, and that's representing the university in a partnership with the hospital and the University of Leeds. Uh, and they've recently taken on the co-director for the Centre for Applied Educational Research alongside Professor Mark Mon Williams from the U University of Leeds. Uh, and the reason I mention those is I, I'm not somebody who's a fan of titles. Um, you know, titles are meaningless, really. It, it's what you do with the job that matters. But what's really interesting with all the work within Bradford is for the first time, I started to see the systems are starting to connect. Because for so long, when we talk about education, education has worked in isolation from health. And then health is working in isolation from sport. But actually, to truly create impactful change, we need to bring all stakeholders together and to get everybody talking the same language and to have the same outcome. And, and I think that's where my research has gone, is to understand why is there a disconnect in the system? And then actually, how do we start to move beyond that disconnect to empower all the different stakeholder groups to come together to solve a problem? Um, the, the last sort of string to my bow um, was a position I was very fortunate to get uh, in Norway, working at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences with Professor Ger Carr Riesland. And I'm working with GK as an associate professor in physically active learning, which in physically active learning is kind of my, my real, it's kind of the real passion. You know, if, if you boil me down to two things, it's whole school change for physical activity and physically active learning. And I've been working with GK across a number of years now, and, and I'm uh, helping to lead the Activate uh, research project, which I'm sure will come on to later. So uh, apologies for, for a long introduction, but uh, it, it's probably the first time I've articulated it in that way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that, that, that's an interesting, interesting story. So not, not the conventional way of going, but you seem very, very happy at how, how things have gone. And and you said the whole systems change, whole systems approach, and and I'm not sure if all the listeners are familiar with it. Could you could you tell a little bit of background? What what is the scientific basis, and how how do you do it? Well, so I would say in everyday language, what does whole systems mean to me? And whole systems is about connecting up the different parts of what we call the system. And the system looks very different based on who you are, where you live, um, and what the structures are within that particular area. So if I, if I give the context of the whole systems project that we have within Bradford, uh, it's funded by Sport England, like I said, and it's a whole system approach within a specific locality within the city. So the way we've approached that is to look at the Isparate Best Investments, And to say, with those disparate best investments, which are the of those eight are best aligned to addressing physical inactivity with children and young people. So sustainable sport within communities, uh, schools, active travel and so on. We then invested in all of those different areas. So we actually have 15 what we've termed work packages. So those 15 work packages within Bradford cover... Um, at an outer level, we're developing um, a digital app to promote physical activity. We're looking at changing the built environment. We're investing heavily within schools. We're looking at travel within the communities. We're working within religious settings and specifically within Bradford, within Islamic religious settings, 
because there's a high British South Asian population. And what we know within the communities that live within the areas within which we're working, physical activity tends to be lower. Um, and one of the reasons is the children attend mosques or madrasas after school. So it's a key opportunity to integrate more physical activity. We've got neighbourhood steering groups who we work with to um, influence physical activity within the local communities. Uh, we've got what we call jump connectors. And their role is to work with the members of the local community to empower them, uh, to build physical activity opportunities. And, and it could be as simple as things like leading walking groups, setting up um, community leadership groups who might take on particular projects. It's looking at building links between community settings and school settings to make sure schools are being used to their potential and they understand all the partners within the local system. Um, We've got Jump Leads, which is we're working with children, young people aged uh, 16 to 24 and empowering those young people to become physical activity leaders and investing in a programme around that. We've got Workforce Development, where we're working with all the different organisations within the locality, not just physical activity organisations, but organisations who have a remit where physical activity could possibly integrate. And we're training that workforce up to help them understand how they can integrate physical activity. And then in the outer area or sort of outer level of that structure, we have a social marketing campaigns. We're working with local politicians and councillors to look at physical activity policy and how we how we can change that policy to in, include more physical activity. But also it's not just the policies themselves. It's looking at the opera, operationalization of those policies into practice. So actually, are they having an impact on the organisations, the communities within which they're working to make sure we get sustainable change? So altogether, those, by a system, we're trying to address each, every single component that we can identify. And we also have the capacity to deliver on um, to create change. And it's a very exciting project. Um, and I count myself as really fortunate to be working on it because opportunities like this come along probably once in a lifetime. Um, and I really hope with everything that we're doing that we can create impact and uh, sustain that impact over a long period of time. But time will tell. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so sounds really interesting. It's what, what, what I hear, it's quite a bit of creating the chains, not as much researching it so how, how do you see the interplay between research and actually action in a way creating the chains and and doing this all of these things how, how do you see it uh, well I'll, first of all I'll start with many sleepless nights <laughs> so uh, as you can imagine um, evaluating something so complex is extremely difficult um, so I'll talk about the development first Uh, and, and how we work with our research and implementation team. So again, one of the reasons we're fortunate with, and it's called the JUMP project, Join Us, Move, Play. One of the, the reasons we're fortunate is the implementation and research team are the same team. We sit together. We have community leads who are responsible for the implementation of the project, and we tender out lots of the work to bring other organizations in. But sat alongside that team is a research, what we've, We change the terminology slightly, and it's really fascinating working with different funders and how they understand the role of research. And what we've been very clear in is that actually to develop the best quality programs, you need to make sure that you're using what we, we now term just evidence-based practice. Hmm. Because if you integrate evidence-based practice, you're using evidence to drive the development of the intervention. And let's be honest, in practice, Probably 80% of the time, at least, that doesn't happen. Um, and definitely not integrating the research evidence. It might integrate previous experience. So we very, our, our research team integrates within the implementation team to help develop up the programs and initiatives. And then the second thing is the research team are there to also evaluate the program as well. So we, we're just, we have just started our control trial. So it's not possible to do an RCT. The, the uh, neighbourhoods were pre-chosen, so we're unable to be randomised. So we've come up with a, a matched control trial. And uh, Dr. Daniel Bingham, who's been running that part of that programme for us, has uh, it's, 
I think he's about probably four fifths of the way through collecting all of the data um, from the school. We've looked at the school level uh, or schools are re- as a representation of the community. So we, so we are using traditional research approaches. So the control trial is our effectiveness measure. And that's going to be done over two years where we've got direct delivery of us working within the neighbourhoods with all of the different work packages being actioned at the same time. And then we'll follow up 12 months later. So at 36 months from the beginning of the intervention, where uh, the, it will be an embed and sustain phase. So we, we have the effectiveness program running alongside a really high quality process evaluation. And to capture the system or the systems change within the process evaluation, we're looking at it in, in a number of different levels, but we're looking at the strategic level, which involves the leadership of the program, the leadership of the organizations, and the leadership of the area. So looking at the policy and strategy change, and that comes at the strategic level. We then have what we call the neighborhood level, and the, the jump area is split into eight different neighborhoods, and each neighborhood has a process evaluation attached to that neighborhood to understand what are the me- well what are the mechanisms of change if ch- if change um, exists how are those coming about who are the actors that are causing that change why are they causing that change so we're, st- we're tracking that within each of the individual neighborhoods um, and it's dr jen hall who's leading that piece of work and, and i have to say he's, he's doing an absolutely fantastic job and one of the things she's introduced in partnership with uh, Dr. James Nobles from the University of Bristol is something called ripple effect mapping, where in, in a ripple effect mapping, and, and, and I am not a specialist in this in any way, shape or form, but my understand, simplistic understanding is you drop the ripple at the, the um, uh, drop of water into the ocean and you see what starts to emerge from that. And you track that across the period of the implementation of the program. Because actually, what, what we fail to really understand in previous work is we, we, ni- we nice and neatly package an intervention. We put that intervention in place. We ask how that intervention's gone, but we don't really look at what that intervention may have led to and what other change that intervention may have caused. And with the complexity of the jump intervention, we felt it was really important that while a control trial will help us look at overall effectiveness, actually what we need to be able to do is understand what's going on within each individual neighbourhood and what what is it, what are the um, ideas that that neighbourhood have come up with in, in um, partnership with the ones that we've implemented with the neighbourhood around schools, organisations, etc. And then the final piece of work, and and I'll be completely honest, this only emerged, we started the control trial in September, so this probably emerged back in March, was we we recognised there was a real gap in understanding the role of organisations and and the behaviour change of the organisation itself. So, how or, or are the organizations changing their behavior based on the jump program the training that we're putting in also being part of the neighborhood workshops are they starting to shift the culture in their organization that is then starting to deliver to the individuals or the families the children etc uh, positive physical activity experiences so dr amanda seams has, has pulled a really great piece of work together to help us look at the impact of the JUMP program on organisational behaviour change, Um, but then also a piece of work to understand how has that happened, why has it happened, what are the sort of active ingredients in that process, so we can start to understand it. this kind of multi-level system. And I guess the final part of the system are the children and the families themselves. So how are they experiencing JUMP? What is it that, because JUMP has got all these different components, through their lived experience of, the, of being in that neighbourhood, how has the perception of that neighbourhood changed in respect to physical activity? So they're, they're a key stakeholder in our uh, process and impact evaluation. And then finally, because we've got 15 different work packages, the, this, that, all that work is about picking up the general systems-based approach. We then have some specific projects. We'd love to evaluate everything, but we just, we just don't have the capacity. 
Um, so if anyone's really interested, please do get in touch. Um, and I really mean that. We, we love to work in partnership with people. Uh, we've, we've brought some PhD students in. So we've got uh, Zoe, one of our PhD students, who is working on the Creating Active Schools work. And then we've got Mary, another PhD student, who is looking at citizen science and physical activity. And then we've got Shania, who was funded through uh, White Rose Doctoral Training Partnership, PhD uh, bursary. She is looking at green space and the co-production of green space within local communities. So, so we're, hope, we're trying to, we're using research to develop insight into what works and, and how it works, if it does work. And if it doesn't work, why not? You know, what is it that we have got wrong? Because, I, I, again, one of my criticisms of, of sort of current research approaches is that we, we spend lots of time developing an intervention. We, you tend to see this, we, try, we trial it in a pilot phase where it shows that it's efficacious. And then we move it to a full trial. And quite often, especially in school-based physical activity, as you progress the full trial, we tend to lose effectiveness. You know, if you look at the, the great um, uh, meta-analysis done by Rebecca Love and, and Esther Van Sluis, um, showed that really on, in terms of whole-day physical activity, school-based interventions were having little effect. So, and I think that for me, part of the problem is we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater, which means... We kind of we've put all this work into this intervention. It's found to be ineffective, and then so we think, oh, that's not an effective approach. We drop the idea and we go on to look at something else. Oh, well, maybe another approach might be more effective. When actually, for me, the problem with research funding is, okay, well, why was it efficacious and why was it not effective? What are the issues that have caused, um, have arisen in that transition? And, and typically what happens is when we design interventions for schools in the pilot phase, we, we design them based on the highest quality research evidence. But actually, sometimes they're not fit um, in the sense of being scalable. So when we scale them, we have to remove some of the ingredients that probably led to them being efficacious. And actually, when, the, when we sort of move to that a one researcher supporting 20 schools, there maybe just isn't the infrastructure there to support the schools to implement at the same level that they were implementing uh, uh, in the kind of um, efficacy stage. So I think we, it, it's, it's almost a, a shifting of the funding system, really, to say, right, OK, we've got the, we, we haven't shown efficacy, uh, sorry, effectiveness, but we need to carry on investing in this and, and really, truly work this product up because we've missed something. So I would hope that all of our learning from Jump, whether it's effective or not, will provide lots of learning to help move the field forward. Mm. Yeah, so a so lot of actions, a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different levels. There must be quite the thing to organize this. And, and what, what do you see as the biggest challenges doing this kind of thing? You have, you have a lot of people working on this, a lot of people affected. How, how do you manage and what are the challenges? I've become a politician. <laughs> um, and, 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 and honestly, I, the, the, you do need to be a politician because you, you have to you have to onboard lots of different stakeholders. And I think going back to one of the points I made in my probably overly lengthy introduction was the understanding the role of different stakeholders. So understanding my role as an academic and actually what motivates me to want to do my job and what are the outcomes that I need to achieve in respect to my role versus somebody who works within education. You know, on a simplistic level, what what are teachers and schools trying to achieve and hopefully we would hope holistic development of children and young people and actually i think many teachers and schools do invest in that but actually a lot of it's around academic outcomes because in the uk that's how schools are measured you know schools are measured and compared to other schools based on what we call their sat scores which are the standard academic test they do so the system of the the education system has evolved to focus on that outcome. Well, if I talk to the people in public health as an example, well, what are the outcomes that they work to? Well, the outcomes that they work to are improving health 
within the local population. So their language is generally obesity, mental health, smoking, alcohol consumption, physical inactivity. So on that simple level, you've got two really key stakeholders who are fundamentally interested in the same thing, which is the holistic development of a child to enable them to reach their potential. And to reach your potential, you need to have good health and you also need to have a good education. But at the moment, I I see the real challenge is the tension between the different systems and actually bringing those systems together to get the stakeholders to talk with each other, to understand each other's language and to come up with a a set of shared outcomes that will help drive provision moving forward. Um, and, and I think the, the the best example of where where we learned those lessons very quickly was in the Creating Active Schools framework and, and how we developed that framework uh, back in June 2019. Mm. Yeah, so basically need to be a politician and and yeah. <laughs> work work a lot of convincing different people. What would you say to listeners who haven't done this but think about implementing something similar in their local region? What would be your your tips to start this kind of thing? What would be the process start small and then add something? So how would you how would you say they should should go forward? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I was fortunate that a lot of the groundwork had been done within the Jump project before I arrived. So Dr. Sally Barber, who was the, the in research terms, the principal investigator, had uh, led the team um, with some other academics to use the evidence to develop the intervention approach. And then uh, Jan Burkhart, who's our implementation director, came in and together they'd worked up the approach that we were going to take. And and where we've been lucky that the funder allowed us to develop that over a period of two years. In terms of the how would I see us being able to help other areas develop their approaches, the, the number one piece of advice is get the key players in the room and start the conversation with So if the danger is if you start to develop a school-based intervention and you only involve um, stakeholders who sit within schools, then it becomes an isolated intervention that's not connecting into the system. So actually, for me, it's around bringing all of the key stakeholders together and creating a movement for change And I think that movement for change then sets the objectives and and maybe where you want to be in five years time, you work together to understand what it is that you're going to prioritize to work on. And and I would always start with a low hanging fruit. Mm. And by that, I mean, you know, don't try to create the most complex intervention and start there. Look at actually how you can get some quick wins on, on board. And and that's when I you know going back to the politician, that's important because you need to bring key actors in the system together who will fund the work. So within the UK, one of the key funders, if you are doing this without where you know we're lucky with the national funding, would be the local authority. So look who are the key players within the local authority, within public health, within education, uh, within community organisations. Bring those people together to try and pull together this shared understanding of what it is you want to achieve, the justification and rationale behind that, and then get them to work together. And I think that that's the point where you will see those different organizations um, jumping on board the journey, but also maybe contributing towards that journey. You know, this is, unfortunately, it's very expensive work. To pull a whole system approach together, requires a lot of finance we, mm. we have a team of probably 25 staff working on this um of which about 15 of the implementation team um, and the rest are, are research so that's a huge team and we're working in one area of bradford mm. so it, it's not easy but but equally don't try don't try to eat the whole cake Look mm. at the slice you want to focus on, 
and, and understand how you can make that slice work and then build out from that. Maybe not the right analogy to use on a <laughs> fiscal activity podcast. Should have used an apple. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is all right. <laughs>